Ha-ha! We appear! Hey, everyone. Hey, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. And so we got a little plug on our last segment. Uh, uh, Zane mentioned, you know, when we were thinking about, um, you know, the, the sort of general trends mm-hmm. of cloud transformation and talking about the CNCF report, that we were thinking a little bit about something uh, like Netlify, which massively simplifies the process of, of releasing code to a web page and how this yeah. is just something that's going to happen kind of everywhere, that it represents a pretty universal trend in, in development tooling. So let's talk about Netlify. Let's talk about what Netlify does. Yeah, so Netlify to me, it's 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 weird to talk about like simplifying tooling. I Whenever I first got into development, you know, you release your website by FTPing a PHP file mm-hmm. up in the server and then it was just there. You know, you went to the you went to the URL in your browser, and it rendered, and that's all you really had to do. And honestly, these these last kind of little bit of time working with Netlify feels like that again. You know, yeah. I I write my codes. I I'm not <laughs> thankfully I'm not deploying it by FTP. You know, I'm yeah. I'm putting well, it in Git. You know. We all lived through a long stage where you would go to GitHub to commit your code. Yeah, and but you would still go to that FTP service in the end to actually like like push it out to the real world, right? Or or some version thereof. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember working at a company where we were very fortunate that we had a development server. You know, a lot of a lot of companies at the time didn't have development servers. You you had mm-hmm. the server where your code lived, whether you, you were working on it or whether it was live for production. That was where your yeah. code was. And that was it. But we had a development server, so we were we were like really fortunate. Um, but it, you were working on the same code over FTP with all the other developers, which meant if somebody started working on the code and then you started working on the same file and then they saved their version and you saved your version, it would just overwrite the yeah, two of them. You would literally yell on the open plan. That's, I think that's where open plan offices came from <laughs> is so that you could yell and say, nobody commit any code right now. I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to fix something. Everybody shut yeah, up. Does anybody else have yeah. master CSS open? Can you close yeah. it, please? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, and and that you know, uh, I, I that very famously almost deleted one of the Pixar movies, right? It's like it's yeah. like a conflict like this, uh, and it was like one copy on a home PC was the only copy that was extant at that point. Yeah, I think that the person who had the copy um, said it was the, the most nerve wracking drive of their life driving yeah. that that PC back from their their house to the the Pixar office. Well, yeah, the this only is the copy of like Toy Story two on it. Yeah, this was the genius of over centralization where it's like, oh, this is great because everybody's working on the same file at all times. Like, well, and then when you lose that one copy, yeah. Yeah, um, it goes with everybody. But no, it's just in Git, you make your commits, your code, you push up, and then Netlify does its magic. And a few moments later, you have a website. And yeah. So, yeah. So the first time I experienced this workflow essentially is watching GitHub, right? Watching GitHub with mm-hmm. hooks, grabbing it and pushing it up to a server, right? I was massively impressed. Um, uh, and uh, Luke Luke Zero Codes, by the way, mentions that that he did in fact teach Aaron everything he knows about net, making Netlify <laughs> plugins. So uh, uh, take that one to the bank, folks. Uh, uh, Luke Zero Codes, great work, thank you. <laughs> um, Easy to say next. I, I was uh, whatever to add a plugin to Netlify into their directory, you have to go and submit a pull request because everything's uh-huh. pull requests, and it, it makes sense. And I did notice when I was submitting mine that Luke had a a one of the first plugins in Netlify. Um, so it's like, they'll let Good anybody work. add code to that repository. <laughs> so um, it actually kind of natural transition here, right? It's like, it's like how it, are Netlify and New Relic related, right? If you're going and building all of your pages, mm-hmm. you know, instrumenting them should be a, a pretty basic step of that. So it's pretty obvious like why one might want like a Netlify plugin for New Relic. Yeah, yeah. Netlify is very much geared towards your kind of Jamstack applications. So you're not going to have an awful lot of instrumentation on the server because like it's serverless. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're going to be instrumenting your application within the browser instead. So like that's a perfect area to um, insert our browser agent, but you don't have, like you can't use our APM agents, for example, you know, you're not going to be installing anything on Netlify servers. It's going to automatically add the agents for you. So instead what the plugin does is does it as part of the build process. Yeah, so you don't need right. to like manually copy and paste this JavaScript code in, it'll do all of that stuff for you. Yeah, and, and so for those for those playing along from home who haven't interacted with our browser monitoring at all, there were sort of essentially two main paths. And by the way, if you're on the browser engineering team and you're yelling at the screen right now, uh, slack me and stop yelling at your screen. But uh, I promise <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm wrong here, let me know and I'll put it in the show notes. But um, um, 
the uh, you know two two main paths are grabbing a snippet and usually some kind of templating tool to make sure it's at the top of most of your pages, or mm -hmm. our APM uh, monitoring can often see when the system is generating HTML and then just automatically shove it into the top of the page. But yeah. if your stack is extremely light, right, you might be generating pages with with something like Netlify or with some other automated tool and not really be in on that process. So you're copying and pasting a little bit more than you'd like. So yeah. so yeah, let's 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 maybe see it in action. Let's go take a look. We'll sure. start start up the screen share. Okay, and of course I have to set, send live because social live is the worst tool for multi streaming <laughs> and should be abandoned. Okay, so we have um, this is just like the the regular Netlify uh, kind of login. So I'm just gonna I've already got this little um, app set up here. We can look at. So I've got this new relic uh, demo app that I've created before. Uh, we can go in and. Really, all this is doing is, as we were talking about earlier, and can we get a, a, like a, a step of browser zoom here? Our, our, browser our, zoom? Sure. Yeah, we've got the... Uh, there we uh, go. Someone, definitely not me, who now needs reading glasses for the first time in her life, uh, might, might, might have an easier time reading it now. Thank you. No problem. You, the, you can tell I haven't streamed for a while because I, I like, just got to the point where I was just always using my browser at like 125%. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I, you sort of always have the so Duplo much. version of the browser that's just zoomed <laughs> way in all the time. It just feels natural, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the app I've built is, like we're talking about, it It just generates a bunch of static pages. I think it, it's set at the moment to do like 300 of them. Um, some lore maps and text and some other bits and pieces in there just to make it look like a regular page. In fact, let's go, we can actually just open up the URL here. Yeah, you know, so I've got a lot of links. Each of these pages is gonna load up some lore mipsum. You know, we've got some yeah. H1, some paragraphs, a few links, you know, things to make it look like a regular kind of page. Not too many pages, but way too many to copy and paste if you some JavaScript. To load exactly, yeah. So what you'd want to do with the browser agent normally is if we view source in this, is it would be in here, like right at the very top of the head tag. You know, that's where you want to insert your browser agent to make sure that it's, because it's going to do a lot of timing things around, you know, time to first paint and, you know, um, all those kind of things, which means it wants to be at the very start of your page loading to get those timings as accurate as possible. Um, but yeah, this this site has, I can look at my previous deploys. You know, so like the current deploy here has got 300 pages. I don't want to be sitting and going through like individual pages and copy and pasting a chunk of JavaScript mm -hmm. into them. Um, so what I can do then is in install the New Relic plugin. So I'm on my application. I'm going to go to plugins. I'm going to go to the plugins directory. I'm going to look at all these lovely plugins that were people who have made here, and we have New Relic. So I'm going to click on install. I'm going to pick my application, and I'm going to hit install, and we're done. Like that's it now, installed, ready to go for us. Um, there is a few configuration options I've got to set. They're detailed. You can go into like options, and then like read plugin docs, which is going to take you to the GitHub repository, which has a nice kind of readme to outline, you know, what the values are you have to set. Yeah. And and this is like, this is such a, like a fundamental thing is when you say, well, you have to do this config and occasionally you'll get questions that's like, oh, well, why do I have to configure? Can I just install it? And this is sort of on the abstract, we have made this as easy as it possibly can yeah. be, right? Because... When you send data, you know, the basic New Relic model, right? You have this piece of code out there somewhere, which knows to go and find the New Relic collector in a very nice asynchronous way so that doesn't block any loads. But it's just going to send that data out to the New Relic collector from anywhere, right? Maybe from yeah. someone's iPad that's connected to Wi-Fi in the Ukraine, right? And so when the New Relic collector gets it, it has to know who is this for. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it's ju just that little label that we. Well, you know, you say, "Oh, well, okay, we'll label who it's for," but <laughs> I don't want you to be able to send data to anyone, <laughs> right? To anyone's like, "Hey, uh, you know, Department of Homeland Security, here, this data's for you," right? Like, mm -hmm. nope, nope. So we need a license key. <laughs> Guess what? We need a license key too. And then finally, it's like, "Hey, what app within that account? What app might it be for?" And that's the yeah. stuff we need to get there. I'm sorry, I'll let you go ahead, but yeah, it's sort of a basic thing. I want to make sure we get out of the way. Yeah, and for, if folks have used like any, like especially if you're doing a Jamstack application where you know you're going to just be interacting with APIs constantly, you're probably used to this kind of workflow. You know where you're going to have these API keys, you're going to have secrets and things you have to set. I've tried to keep it as minimum as possible. So these are the 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 like bare minimum 
settings that you have to enable in order to, mm -hmm. to, have, to have the plugin do the browser monitoring. But there is a lot of other settings. Like these are all settings you can change. You know, so I've tried my very, very best to give them like really sensitive defaults. The defaults are all listed here as well. You know, so things like distribute tracing for the, it's, you know, turned on by default. So is like cookies are turned on by default. I've set the concurrency, you know, to a nice five. You might want to bump that up or, you know, all these different things you can set yourself. They all have nice, hopefully sensible defaults. Um, but there is a lot of other configuration you can do if you want to, you know, but these settings are just like the bare minimum to get it working. Yeah, so um, if you want to really, get subtle with how we're instrumenting your page or what we're grabbing, you can configure that, but you just need these four settings at, at the top. And that's it, you're done. Um, you can set them in your netlify.toml file, which is like a config file that you can um, include in your Git repository. I would say it's not exactly, be it's not really best practice to include secrets um, in your Git source files. So the way in which I've done it is you can also, the, you can also do it as part of your uh, deploy settings. So I'm going to go back in here into my settings and there's an the environment and you can set them all as environment variables. So I've already set all mine up here um, as different environment variables. Um, so I've got those done ahead of time. So now I can go with the plugin installed, go back to my deploys, and let's just like re-trigger this deploy. So normally whenever you're triggering a deploy, you're, you would go and you'd make your changes, you push up the GitHub, it would trigger the deploy and stuff on your behalf. Um, in this instance, I'm just, I'm not making any changes. I'm telling it, hey, redeploy the last page. But because I've just enabled that plugin, it's not going to do that deployment again, but this time it's going to use the the new Relic plugin as part of it. And it's, like, it. it's running through all the stuff here. So yeah, we've got like our Netlify build version. It's um, We had like our node version up here as well. And here, there we go, loading plugins. So we've got this new Relic Netlify plugin um, has been loaded. It's running through all the different events. You know, we've got like, here's it generating the pages. It's in this on post event. So after the build is finished, but before the deployment has occurred is where I'm going to write in that. The new Relic snippet. Code. Got it. Yeah, um, so it, then, it looks like it's quick. So it's not adding much to our build time. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have like under half a second to do 300 odd pages. Pretty nice. Uh, tried to get it as quick as I can. Um, yeah. It does some funky things to make sure that you know, it's injecting the code in the right place and stuff. So it has to be a HTML page. You know, the HTML page has to have a, a very minimum of body tag, which I know, strictly speaking, with the HTML spec, the body tag can be left out mm -hmm. um, because the browsers will automatically inject it for you and things. But yeah, I guess I'd be interested to know what data we would gather if you didn't have a body tag. But anyway. Uh, but it's other stuff. It looks to see if you've got a content distribution um, attachment, which means that the browser shouldn't render the page, but instead should force the browser to download it. You know, if it does have that, then it won't inject it because interesting. You know, it, it tries to be smart about when it should inject it for you and when it shouldn't. Um, it's all open source. It's all on GitHub, so you can you can check um, the regex as it's running and how it's trying to figure out whether it should inject it or not. It's actually. I'm I'm normally a Python person, um, mm -hmm. and I ported, I ported the code from our Python agent as to how it figures out where to inject into a Django page. <laughs> ah, gotcha. Yeah, that's clever. So it's all done. It's all deployed. It takes like less than a minute to that deployment of 300 pages. We can then go back and look at our. Um, let's just refresh this so we can see the information it gives us here. So you can see, yeah, my new Relic plugin ran. Here's my results. You know, we recorded three events. So these events have been sent across the new Relic as well. And we injected the pay, the agent into 301 pages. If there was any pages that it couldn't inject into because of any of those reasons I just talked about, they would be listed here as well. So you go like, hey, I saw you had, you know, whatever.html, but your, there's a tag in here that says this is actually a streaming um, page rather than a regular static page. So I'm not going to and that kind of stuff. Got and it. if you go look at the actual pages themselves, we have so one up here. The browser agent is now installed. Got it. So and what it's also doing, let's bump this up a little bit for you, is this bit here is also tagging it to a release as well. Ooh, nice. So I can see what what 
uh, project it is that um, it's coming so out on. Correlate with this with the the Netlify release tracking. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. 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 So nice. if you get if you get any like JavaScript errors or anything like that, um, you'll then be able to see exactly what release the errors come from as well. Very very cool. So the other part of this then is we have a quick start for it. So that's it all installed. Like that's it done. You know, most of the time we just be talking about regexes. Yeah. <laughs> like it's installed. Yeah. And then on the other side is we have um, on your relic, we have a quick start. So I'm going to have a look for here. We've got this Netlify quick start. We've got like our little overview page. It's going to explain, you know, what's included in it. We've got dashboards. We've got some alerts and things. I'm just going to install this. It's going to be a little synopsis, just confirming what I want to install. I'll bump this up a bit so people can see it too. So we can see, you know, it's going to it's going to install the Netlify dashboards. It's going to install three alerts: um, a page load time alert, a JavaScript errors alert, and a build field alert. Um, this note is like worth paying attention to: is it will install the alerts for you. It will not enable them. So right. you need to go in and actually switch those alerts on. Yeah, and that makes some sense, right? We don't necessarily want like a a quick start to start sending a bunch of alerts to maybe the admins on our on our thing. Oh, and that, that would be another thing is right. Not every not every account for New Relic can enable alerts. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. We I don't, I don't necessarily want to start getting alerts from the intern who just figured out how to log into New Relic. <laughs> yeah. But I also don't want people like installing this quick start and being and come shouting at me on Twitter because they didn't know their builds were failing, and even though I told them their alert was going to, it sounds like no, you got to enable it first. Um, but yeah, yeah it'll, it'll create them all for you. Just go in and enable them. But I'm going to hit the begin installation. So it has and, its own and, installation plan. And Part while you that. do that, I do just want to get on my little hobby horse for a minute, which is that at, by getting you know build notifications and seeing the build process, which we're going to see in just a minute in the dashboard. This really points to, to a fundamental change at New Relic, which is pushing a little bit into the development cycle. So mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of just being concerned with software running in production, we're also looking at how it's built and distributed. So I go ahead with that while I mute myself and then cough uproariously. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the installation instructions here is just going to um, basically take you off to the plugin um, readme about how to install the plugin, which we've just done. So I can skip that step. And uh, now it's going to run for the deploy. It's deployed in the dashboard and my alerts. I can go see my data. And it's going to load up the little dashboard here. So the first one I've got is like my overview of everything. You know, so I've got like some stats breakdowns. I've got my JS errors, trends. Um, but this is like just a really rough, you know, load times, errors, traffic volumes. But then I can start drilling down into it as well. So I've got like my traffic here. Um, so I can see, you know, my page views. I can see my page load times. I can see my unique sessions. I should point out as well, this demo app looks like it has a lot of traffic. Um, all of this traffic is coming from New Relic Synthetics as well. Right, from our own, from our own pa page visiting bot. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have it um, testing the site like every five minutes from 20 locations around the world, it Peace. loads up like, you know, a hundred pages or something. Um, so yeah, really, really low page latency for our bots as well, which is really nice to see. Yeah. Um, lots of sessions, uh, cause it's a new session every time the bot hits it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so traffic, we've got like response times, you know, we can see like our page load. Oh, right, yeah, no, the sessions would not be clicking around because unless you use a step bot, Right, it's always just going to load the page and then leave. Yeah, yeah, so that's exactly that's okay. It's like we posted a viral article where the the punchline was that didn't really happen. Sorry, <laughs> so, you know, people people just closed the tab. They didn't want to learn more about about that. Yeah, every 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 bot we see is just a brand new person. So yeah, <laughs> it also means as well, like whenever we get down um, in the next tab for the users, let's just go look at that actually now. Uh, it's like, yes, our device type and our OS and our browser. Are all like one type. All one type. We are, we, are, we are a niche internet micro celebrity with just <laughs> one type of fan. You can see that the, the bot hits the, the page a lot more frequently than even I do while testing. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> they got, they've got four nines. Um, nice. Whereas I want to get like a little tiny bit from my Mac. Yeah. But yeah, it's got breakdown then, um, you know, load times by device, by OS, by browser page views by all the same metrics, you know, 
what the what slowest devices are, the slowest browsers. So if you have a yeah. particular performance issue on a particular browser, it'll start to highlight here. And, and, these are and like this, this really matters if you deploy to a large uh, uh, user base, especially one that may be institutional users where they may have one exact uh, browser build. And yeah. so they're saying, hey, we've never been able to replicate this slowness. They complain about these other problems. It's like, well, go and check and see, are you the slowest for one OS or one <laughs> browser? Yeah. And, and you can do it by like, because the the... Um, I'm able to simulate this because our synthetics are like in so many places around the world is I do have things around, you know, page views and countries and um, ASN, which is essentially ISPs. Um, there's other organizations that could be kind of the ASN, but for most people, those are going to be the ISP they're using. Um, yeah, you can see here like Comcast, Bellsife, um, Amazon. Again, that's all be coming from the one of the bots. You know, University of California, these are all like the service providers, breakdown by cities, by country, you know, so you really get a lot of kind of different user metrics side of it too. And all these graphs and all are set up as part of the quick start for you. There's nothing you need to configure. Got our core web vitals. This is where we're getting into that stuff I was talking about, about why it's so important to have that script as as close to the top of the page as you can, because you know we're looking here at our first content fill paint and our, our input delay and our cumulative layout shift and all of these stats that will mean so much to uh, front end developers that I kind of understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, all yeah, of those first input delay. Well. Yeah, this is this is all stuff about like you know loading the whole page start to finish is not a really good model for performance for some people, yeah. right? Especially if you're doing a complex interface, it's like, hey, you know, when, when I open your page, I go to post right away and that takes forever. And so that first input delay is really critical. But yeah, a bunch of other stuff is like, you have to, I mean, front end is science and an art. And so, yeah. you know, sorry, you have to be a lot better at it than I am to, to, to know what all this stuff means. Yeah, it's the, the whole um, performance perception rather than like actual performance, you know, it's, it's yeah. yeah, your stats can be, or your, you know, your server can be telling you that I'm serving this page up in, the, you know, fractions of a millisecond. Yeah. But if it's taking your JavaScript, you know, seconds and seconds to actually render it, that's what your user's going to care about. They're not going to care how fast their, their browser received the page if they can't interact with it for, like, 30 seconds. Yeah, my, my um, HMO has this where it loads it loads and tells you, you have no appointments today. And then a solid minute later is like, oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> I, would, like, I would just uh, never have an appointment then. Oh, yeah. like, oh, no yeah, appointments like, oh, good, I, don't, else. I don't have to go to the doctor. I'm just standing here in a medical center for no reason. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, then we have our JavaScript errors, which is exactly as you would expect it to be, you know, kind of error counts. Um, I've done things with trends so you can compare your error rates as to what they were like a week ago and stuff. Um, Oh, time series step is large and allowed. Let's change this. Let's do the last 24 hours then. There we go. So this is where it's, you can see the breakdown by release ID. So this is how it was tagging those releases in the browser agent. Um, so I only have the one release ID in this one um, at the moment, but like I should have multiple different releases going out and you'll be able to see your different, your number of JavaScript errors per release. So you'd immediately be able to identify of like, oh, that release we just put out is error rate is twice as high as you know the previous release. We might need to roll that back, you know that kind yeah. of thing. Um, it also has all your stuff around, you know, different classes of errors. Again, errors broken down by device types, and then we have like a little table kind of going through, you know, your most recent errors. What so, uh, so on. by the way, Luco Code uh, 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 contributes. Right, luckily Google Crawl en enables JavaScript now, but Jamstack should render all its content with JavaScript disabled, using JavaScript only to enhance the experience. Uh, which, uh, which is a, a what 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 a fond dream that <laughs> I would ever see a page that actually renders all of its content even if JavaScript is disabled. I mean, it's there somewhere, even if it's under uh, eight thousand pixels of white space, it's there somewhere. But yes, that is that is the goal: is that Jamstack should have its content all be there even if JavaScript isn't enabled. Yeah, progressive enhancement. I mm -hmm. um, remember the days of having to test all of my web pages and links, the, the text-only browser. Yeah, I, I, one time sure. there was a, a, a large and significant uh, you know, open source project which had a, a serious accessibility issue, and I couldn't get answers on fixing it, and so I ended up like uh, 
submitting a PR that like fixed all the problems with like jQuery at the foot of the page. So it was just like, yeah, this is a really bad way to fix it, but like people can't access the site right now. So, <laughs> you know, uh, you got to do something. Your tab indexing is all messed up. So, you know, there you go. Yeah. For me, it was always just that a lot of the assistive devices um, for a long yeah. time couldn't, didn't process JavaScript very well. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I make sure it had like a, um, a text only version of the page rent or was mm -hmm. usable. Um, there was the, and using something like links was the only way I could kind of semi test that experience. But these days the assistive devices are a lot better. And much like as Luke is saying, Google crawler and I enables JavaScript. So did those yeah. assistive devices like th these synthetics that's generating all of this data for, for this test site, they're rendering the JavaScript. That's why I'm getting these JavaScript errors, yeah. you know, cause these are like, and errors I'm injecting into the page to show in these dashboards. So it, it is yeah. executing the JavaScript so we get this data. Pretty nice. And then finally, the bit you were talking about that's like different from where we're um, before is like these build events, you know, so we can track when builds start, when builds end, we can track all our different build events, you know, so um, we have kind of like our on, our pre-build or on build, post-build, that you can you can decide what events you want to send from um, Netlify to New Relic, and it's all configurable in in the plugin as well. So if you only care about like you know when a build starts and when it and when it fails or successes, whatever, you can only send those. This is showing like let's just give it a much bigger time frame. Oh, not that big, a month. Yeah, you know, so we can see here all the different kinds of build events that I was sending them free. We've got like error events, we've got like success events, posts, and you can see they kind of correspond in these big spikes because like each build will trigger one of each of these events normally. Um, so that's like, you're gonna get all of that information around your number of builds per day when they occur. They send some extra information about the builds. Um, which is things like the context that was that was deployed in. So in Netlify, you're going to have two contexts. You're going to have production and you're going to have preview. And preview is whenever you have created a new pull request mm -hmm. and that's triggered a preview build. So you can go check like how your site looks before you actually push it into production. And um, preview builds are not tracked by the plugin by default, but it is one of these additional settings in here you know, is you can enable browser monitoring for previews and you'll start getting nice. all your preview data as well. Yeah. And this, this sort of matters, especially as you are trying to, to observe more further up into the stack is right. You can see both builds and you can see things like previews that are showing up and to try to get as this thing, you know, um, we're seeing growth in it and we have questions about it. we're trying to support it obviously with stuff like code stream to say hey having some observability insight into how your code is building and deploying is a really key piece of the story and not just for the sort of deployment markers which we've had for a while which is yes this this production problem was probably caused by a deploy but to yeah. get developers used to going in and taking a look and saying hey here's what's going on in like staging or development right now uh, you know, at those levels. And uh, this is, this brings mm -hmm. us to core skew. Go check out the core skew if you want to get some of your developers logged in, but we won't, we won't belabor it here, but yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> and like, as well as just the dashboards, you know, you, all the data that the dashboard is pulling is, is in your like one. So I can like go into, you know, my errors box here. Um, and I can start looking for those errors that are coming through. Um, you know, so let's just pick the first one here. And like, it's going to give me, you know, so here's the, that release ID again that we were talking about earlier. It's going to give me, you know, the first time it saw it, last time it seen it, you know, occurrences, all of the stuff that you get, um, you know, as part of new Relic one, you're going to get from the plugin. You know, it's, it's like, it's because it's coming from the browser agent, you're still going to get all of the, the usual goodies that you're used to, you know, mm -hmm. so we've got our stack trace here. It's coming up as, as anonymous because it's an inline script tag. It's not like in a file. Um, if this was an external file, then it would like be able to tell me where it like originated from. Instead, I just get you know the file name up here, um, and then the line that the error occurred on. You know, so I could then go, okay, so this is what line page thirty five, um, line fifty two. So hopefully, I should be able to go you know to my pages here. There's directory one, page thirty five, page thirty five. Yeah, and I can like let's see the page source. And it should be an error at the bottom of this. Yeah, here we go. 
All right, nice. So all the usual things you've got for, um, and you were like one, to be able to look through errors or the events, you know, all of those build events are in as regular events too. You know, I can go and I could go into my explore data, go into the events and look at those. Like I don't need to use the dashboards for it. Like they're, uh -huh. they'll all be in here too. Um, so yeah, it's, the quick starts are a great way to get the the data and you can start to explore it really quickly and see it all graphed out uh, really quickly. But then um, if you want to go in and really dive deep into it using your relic, you've got all of those tools available to you as well. Yeah, Aaron, this is this is so cool. And, and is this this is available in the plugin directory now for Netlify? It is, yeah, yeah, it is all live. Um, it is available to install via Netlify um, in their plugin directory, uh, just in the plugins here. Um, it's also, it's published onto NPM. So you can go, you can check it out there. It's just at like new relic forward slash Netlify plugin. Um, the source is all published. It's um, under our new relic experimental. Um, so it is, you know, being developed in open. We're mm -hmm. always happy to to take kind of um, feedback or uh, any requests for additional features and stuff. I'll be, I um, would love to have those too. People should go like, yeah, go check out the, the plugin there. Go look at what the additional kind of things you can do with it is. Um, I said, you can install it directly from within Netlify or you can install it in your, uh, using your Netlify Tomo as well, just by referencing the, this at New Relic Netlify plugin. So nice. Be able, everywhere you could possibly want it. Nice. All right. Well, I love this. I, I want people to go and check it out. And uh, otherwise, of course, uh, you know, come on back for the Nerd Log next Thursday. Um, what else do we want to cover? Aaron, is there places you want to be found? Um, do check out the New Relic blog where we write up the, the process for this. But uh, uh, other stuff, you, Aaron, you want people to check out? Um, yeah, so normally the best place to reach me is on, on Twitter. Um, so definitely just Aaron Bassett. Go hit me up there. Um, DMs are always open. If people have any comments or questions about the plugin, feel free. Other things I have to kind of shout out is um, we also hang about a lot in our uh, community Slack. So if you've got any anything you want to ask there as well, there'll be some folks from um, the Node team. They'll be able to answer things as well myself in that. So please do sign up for our community Slack. And I know you talked about it a little bit in the last segment um, mm -hmm. about uh, Future Stack. Mm -hmm. And I just like to call it as well that the CFP for Future Stack. If you're watching this live right now, the CFP for Future Stack ah. is still open. Um, so please do go check that out as well. I will tweet a link um, to that. And I'm sure there'll be one. We'll drop it in the show notes as well. But yeah, make sure you well. get it to me on Slack so I make sure I get it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, go go if you've got something interesting you want to talk about. Um, we'd, love to, we'd love to have you at Future Stack. Please go check out the CFP or just go check out Future Stack in general. Um, but yeah, that's the things I need to share out today. I love it. And yes, do check out Super Feature Stack. Definitely, uh, you know, consider submitting the CFP. I'd say if you have something to talk about with observability, I would be excited to hear from you. So uh, do do hit us up. And uh, yeah, otherwise, thank you so much for joining everybody. Uh, it's great to see so many people, people chatting a little bit in the, the Slack chat and tons and tons of viewers on LinkedIn Live. So that was really fun. Um, folks, we will see you again next Thursday for more Nerd Log. Allie will be back. Don't worry. If you're wondering what happened to Allie, uh, she'll be back next week. She's off this week. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining, everybody. <laughs>